Mr. The President of the Jury, uh, members of the jury. Uh, my presentation today is entitled Optimizing Resource Allocation in Cellular Wireless Networks. I will start by briefly presenting my CV, then I will state the main elements that illustrate the evolution of cellular wireless networks. I will give an overview of uh, my research approach and focus on three main contributions. Finally, I will present some promising perspectives that stem from our research works. I obtained my PhD from ENT Atlantique in April 2006. After my graduation, I joined Nokia Bell Labs, working as a research engineer for one year. I was appointed as an associate professor at UT Saint Malo in 2007. Between 2016 and 2022, I was with the Faculty of Engineering at St. Joseph University in Beirut. Cellular wireless networks are undergoing a continuous multi-scale evolution since their early adoption as communication means. They have grown from networks that solely support voice communications to networks that support diverse services, such as access to the internet, vehicular communications, or internet of things. The underlying technologies have, al have also evolved proportionately with rates going from kilobits per second to gigabits per second in the latest 5G. In the light of these considerations, it is important to identify the patterns in the evolution of cellular wireless networks. These patterns consist in increasing spectral and energy efficiency, supporting heterogeneity and densification of deployment, enabling massive connectivity with the advent of Internet of Things, and capitalizing on network automation and virtualization. In the last decade, wireless communication networks have achieved a thousand-fold capacity increase. This increase was mainly due to the radio improvement and new spectrum acquisition. In these figures, I plot the utilization of the wireless spectrum in the city of Rennes in France since 1994. In early days, we note that GSM, represented in blue, was mainly deployed in the 900 megahertz. Then, Higher bands, such as 1.8 and 2.1 gigahertz, were explored with the arrival of UNTS and LTE. More recently, in 2019, we see that the spectrum is expanding even more with the addition of lower bands in the 700 megahertz, represented in gray at the bottom of the figure, and higher bands in the 3.5 gigahertz, represented in pink. The latter band is typically dedicated to the new 5G deployments. Alas, spectrum acquisition is, without any doubt, limited by the scarcity of the radio resources. It is also rendered complex by the diverging national and regional regulations. Hence, increasing the efficiency of using this radio spectrum is inevitable. With 5G, the wireless access technology known as 5G and R, targets a peak spectral efficiency of 30 bits per second per hertz in the downlink. Noting that 5G uses typically similar modulation and special multiplexing parameters as in LTE, this high efficiency can only be possible by leveraging more than one channel of communication with the help of massive MIMO and techniques such as beamfold. When fulfilling the demanding performance requirements, cellular wireless networks need to improve the system efficiencies. And these efficiencies do not only include the spectral efficiency we have seen, but also the energy efficiency. In fact, energy consumption is a major contributor to operating costs in cellular wireless networks. Looking at the data collected from a European network give very interesting insights. Some products like baseband unit in green are almost always activated and consume around 40 watt hour, while others such as massive MIMO radio unit consume three times more energy when only when activated. This data highlights the importance of building with precision the radio network, being conscious about deploying the high capacity, high energy consuming modules only where needed. Increasing energy efficiency in cellular wireless networks requires system-wise optimization, taking into account various requirements such as quality of service, initial access, and mobility. And 
that this energy reduction can be obtained by switching off one or more carriers, antennas, or even cells as in discontinuous transmission. Similarly, 5G NR follows a new ultra lean design in which control signals are not consistently tra transmitted in every radio frame, but on demand and scarcely uh, according to the demand in the cell. This ultra lean design facilitates 5G sleep modes, including sophisticated symbol carrier or even channel shutdown mechanism, which can significantly reduce the energy consumption. With a spectrum efficiency approaching its limit, cellular networks revert to diversification and densification in order to increase their capacity. The following figures show a heat map of the density of antennas in REN in 2013 and in 2023. As noted, the densification follows a special demand with an increasing number of antennas in the crowded city center and in the southern district. Such densification reduces the pass loss, reduces the load factor, and increases the desired signal, but unfortunately leads also to increasing the interfering signal. Densification is often associated with frequency reuse, and this gives rise to intercell interferences, and the coordination between cells becomes crucial, whether done statically, dynamically, or in a coordinated fashion. The pace of densification has reached uh, extraordinary values, as shown in the city of Fran. Antennas from different technologies are being deployed at a rate of 150 antennas per year since 2019. However, deployment of additional micro base stations involves significant cost and elaborate site planning. In such context, heterogeneous networks offer a simple, cost effective alternative to the cell splitting. These heterogeneous networks consist of dense layers of small cells deployed for capacity and high data rates under a global macro layer deployed for the coverage. New challenges stem from such heterogeneity. How to efficiently handle the interference between different cells? How to manage the dual connectivity or the mobility between layers? Wireless access technologies play a pivotal role in the adoption of the Internet of Things. They help in meeting the uh, requirement of massive connectivity in terms of battery lifetime, capacity, and coverage. In time communications that are particularly adapted for IoT. This scenario requires a maximum coupling loss of 164 dB, which ensures large coverage, a battery lifetime that should be beyond 10 years and the density which should exceed 1 million nodes per square kilometer. Recently, low power wide area networks have gained considerable attention in trying to meet these MMTC requirements. Low power wide area networks follow two design principles. The first one is to leverage and adapt the existing cellular technologies as in cellular IoT. And the other design choice is to devise new clean slate technologies such as, for example, LoRaWAN. Contrary to the previous generations, the evolution towards 5G does not solely include an increase in data rates. In fact, 5G new radio addresses a variety of usage scenarios, high data rates with EMBB, low latency and massive connectivity with MMTC. Thus, slicing a single physical network into multiple isolated virtual networks has emerged as a key solution to support the large variety of services. Each slice has its own KPIs, which is a trade-off bound to the target use. With the cellular network growing in complexity, automation has also become crucial. And the need for operators to automate their networks is very important to lower the operational costs. In such context, the very well-known self-organizing networks concept is currently evolving to include concepts from artificial intelligence or machine learning. In fact, the modern cellular networks can be seen as a set of resources that need to be orchestrated in order to deliver services with different and various constraints. The contribution of AI and ML is undeniable, and it could be at the planning level, the diagnostics, the optimization, and the control of the network. And this is also followed by an evolution of the standards, 
like we have the new architectures such as ENI by Etsy, the ORAN architecture, or new interfaces by 3GPP that facilitate the adoption of AI. But beside all the enthusiasm, the adoption of AI is still at its infancy. My research activities are part of the global topic of resource optimization in networks. The topic follows two tracks, a research track on cellular networks, including technologies like HetNet or full duplex, and architectures like CRAN or network slicing. Another track that deals with the particularities of Internet of Things with technologies such as LoRaWAN and IoT. In both cases, the objectives consist in maximizing the energy efficiency, the spectral efficiency, or devising automation algorithms for resource allocation. In these frameworks, I have led scientific activities and contributed to advancing the state of the art in the scheduling problems, power allocation, interference mitigation, or user association problems. Starting with mathematical optimization tools, in particular convex optimization, my work was progressively enriched with tools from game theory or machine learning. Often the usage of these three tools allowed us to reveal new facets, new insights on the problem at hand. The first research challenge I'm going to present today deals with full duplex communications. In our research work, we will answer the crucial questions on how can full duplex double the spectral efficiency of a no FDMA network with the help of optimized power allocation and scheduling. Contemporary progress in telecommunication technologies have made full duplex wireless communication feasible. Theoretically, full duplex promises to double the capacity of a wireless networks by allowing devices to simultaneously use the same radio resource to transmit and receive. Let us consider a basic scenario with the base station being in full duplex and mobiles are still in half duplex. We know that such network suffers from additional interferences, the self-interference at the base station and the co-channel interference between the two mobiles using the same radio resource. Thus, we need to rewrite our SNR formulas for the full duplex. For example, the SNR computed for the uplink user is equal to the transmit power of this user, PIK, multiplied by the channel gain, HIK, and divided by a noise and interference term. And the interference term written here corresponds to the self-interference. It's actually the power of the interfering base station using the same radio resource to transmit divided by a specific self-interference cancellation factor. Similarly, the SNR on the downlink for user J is equal to the transmit power of the base station, P0K, multiplied by the channel gain, HJK, and divided by a noise plus interference term. The interference term comes from the uplink user using the same radio resource, PIK, multiplied by the channel gain between both users. With these new types of interferences, we need to rethink how scheduling is done in a full duplex wireless network. In our works, we devised a scheduling objective that maximizes the sum of the user SNR. Our scheduler is hybrid, and it allows to uh, schedule resources, whether in full duplex, as represented by the Z optimization variables, or in half duplex, as represented by the Y optimization variables, depending on which choice yields a higher sum of utilities. We also can consider dynamic non full buffer traffic and define a parameter, alpha p, which is a re resource utilization factor. This factor is needed to verify that the resource blocks are efficiently allocated. Thus, we constrain the number of bits that can be transmitted or received by a user, multiplied by this utilization factor to be less or equal than the demands or the number of bits in the queue. Finally, we obtain a max SNR hybrid full duplex scheduling optimization. This problem takes as an input the users, uplink and downlink, 
and computes an optimal pairing of these users on the available radio resources in a way to maximize the network performance. This is a mixed integer linear problem that we can solve numerically for a reasonable network size. But in order to enable, in order to enable scalability of the solution, we provide a heuristic algorithm that simply allocates resources for each RB uh, in a greedy manner. We also provide a different formulation that ensures proportional fairness between the users. Here, the utility is the ratio between the number of bits a user can transmit divided by the historical throughput of this user. Let us look at typical performance of our algorithms. We consider a single cell scenario with 15 resource blocks, 10 uplink user, 10 downlink user, each having a demand of two megabits per second. And we plot the CDF of the user throughput. The trends which are set in these results are pretty clear. With full duplex max SNR in blue, around 70% of the users attain a throughput equal to the demand. FD max SNR immensely outperforms the half duplex which is represented in purple, where only 45% of the users attain their demand. Not bad, proportional fairness makes some kind of a trade-off or compromise, and it favors low rate users that obtain at least 0.8 megabits per second. Full duplex networks need information on the radio channel between users, and this information is not available with current wireless networks. So let us assess the importance of such information on the quality of the scheduling. In blue, we show the throughput attained by FT Max SNR users with complete CSI when we know all the channels between all the users. On the, on the opposite side, in purple, we have a scheduling that, do not, do, that does not have any information on the channel between users. And we see the gap in performance between these two cases. When we add the information about only the path loss, we see the improvement in the performance in the red curve. So adding the path loss information improves the quality of the schedule. But in any case, we should note that it is uh, important that full duplex, regardless of the estimation errors, is always way better than half duplex counterpart. So we need an algorithm that enables to schedule users without the knowledge of inter-user channel. And our approach is based on reinforcement learning. It does not need to estimate inter-user channel, but rather learns how to best allocate radio resources to the pairs of users. The agent in this reinforcement learning is the scheduler. The environment is a set of users, uplink and downlink. The action is to pair users in couples, uplink and downlink using the same resource. And the reward of a pairing action is expressed in terms of bits transmitted or received on an allocated resource. The algorithm will reward each pair depending on the actual number of bits that are transmitted. And the adaptation turns out to be challenging, primarily due to the non-full buffer traffic. In this figure, we plot our reinforcement learning algorithm with different learning rates back, and three reference scheduling algorithms with complete CSI. So we see that with a learning rate equal to 0, 01 plotted in blue, the reinforcement learning algorithm gives very close results to the max sum rate, which has a complete channel state information and plot in red. Around 70% of the users attain a throughput that's equal to the demand. Let us now examine the challenges of scheduling and power allocation in the context of multi cell full duplex wireless networks. This is definitely a more realistic scenario, and it better envisions how full duplex would be de deployed in practice. However, the pres presence of multi cells greatly magnifies the interferences. We have co channel and self-interference, and we have also interferences coming from base station and users in the other set. In an indoor scenario, the average UE throughput value for half duplex users is around two megabits per second. 
and it's plotted in purple. Uh, whereas the average UE throughput for full duplex algorithm in red and blue is between three and four megabits per second. So full duplex in outdoor scenario achieves almost double the throughput compared to half duplex. In an outdoor pico cell scenario, which is represented on the right, the difference is smaller and full duplex throughput values vary between two and three megabits per second. Whereas half duplex is still between 1.5 and two megabits per second. Hence, we know that the gains of full duplex in an outdoor high interference scenario are limited, although still valid in this case. And we know that efficient scheduling is very important in order to take the full advantage of full duplex. Take for example, the random scheduling round robin in here, it performs worse than the half duplex counterpart. In addition to the work on full duplex, we have contributed to the state of the art on energy efficiency by providing algorithms for power control and user association in a multicellular and heterogeneous network. Our work on spectral and energy efficiency is published in major journals and conferences in the domain. We have two simulators, one for full duplex and one for the energy efficiency that are available for public and that facilitate the reproducibility of our results. The second research challenge I am presenting today deals with the heterogeneity and densification of deployment. In our research works, we answer the crucial question on how to efficiently mitigate the impact of cross-tier and co-tier interferences, how to design distributed user association algorithms that enable to associate users in a heterogeneous network with the presence of millimeter wave base stations. In our representation, 5G heterogeneous networks are typically composed of multiple tiers. Macro base stations represented in blue that deliver basic long range coverage with a double overlay of fan 2 bss represented in red and millimeter wave BSs in green. And the crosses represent the users that are randomly distributed in this geographical area. These small cells, whether fem 2 or millimeter wave BSs, provide short range, but high quality, high data rate communication for users in their vicinity. If millimeter waves are typically noise rather than interference limited, the increased density of these fan 2 base stations render co-tier and cross-tier interference very negative and prohibitive. So we need to design new radio resource management algorithms in order to mitigate such interference while efficiently associating users to the various technologies and tiers. In our works, we introduced a novel formulation of the spectrum allocation and user association problem as an optimization. The variables X, J, K represent the decision of associating resource blocks to base stations and the variable theta ij represent the user association. The objective consists of maximizing the traffic allocation on base stations that offer the highest data rates represented by the row variable while at the same time maximizing the entropy and ensuring load balancing. Here we obtain a mixed integer nonlinear problem that's unfortunately intractable in practice and specifically for a large number of variables in realistic scenarios. But since spectrum allocation and user association take place on different time scales, we propose a solution framework that is represented in two building blocks. And this framework is represented in the following figure. The first building block aims at computing the spectrum allocation for the network cells. We consider separately millimeter waves because they use a disjoint frequency spectrum. For macro and femto cells, we start by deciding the spectrum sharing. Then we use a cell load estimation algorithm in order to allocate resource block to each cell. Our cell load uh, uh, estimation algorithm captures the user distribution and the radio coverage. The second building block computes the user peak rate and SNR per base station for each user in the network, then associate users to base stations. In fact, our coordinated framework enables to implement various algorithms at each level. For the spectrum allocation, 
we designed a new resource block allocation algorithm based on non-cooperative game theory, where each friend to sell selects a pool of least interfered resource blocks. We demonstrate that we have an exact potential game and best response dynamics, simple best response dynamics, enabled to compute the Nash equilibrium. We also implement basic co-channel and separate channel static allocations for comparison. As for the user association, the second column, we formulate a central convex optimization, a game theory based, and also multiple state of the art approaches such as power based user association, peaklet based, or the bias introduced in small cell first. Finally, we obtain multiple approaches consisting of combinations in the algorithms displayed here. For example, we can have a fully distributed solution with best response spectrum allocation and best response user association, or we can have a static heuristic co-channel spectrum allocation associated with power-based user association. These are typical coordinated frameworks with different variants of the algorithm. Let us consider one example algorithm and focus on the distributed user association in order to better understand how it proceeds. As we have an exact potential game, best response dynamics enable to reach the fusion, pure Nash equilibrium. Such best response al uh, um, algorithm iterates over all the users in step four and solves a convex optimization by a subgradient projection. These are step seven to step 14. And we can see that in subgradient sub projection, we have the computation of the derivative of the objective and a projection that ensures that the constraints are satisfied. And the global iteration of these algorithms converge to a pure Nash equilibrium in a small number of iterations. We start by analyzing the performances of the simulated algorithms. The figure on the left displays the numerical values of the objective of the coordinated algorithms whereas the figure on the right shows the percentage of users associated with macro, femto, and millimeter wave base stations. We note that the best response spectrum allocation, whether with a distributed user association or a centralized user association, these are the two boxes on the left, achieves the best performances. In fact, they benefit from an intelligent best response spectrum allocation that estimates the load in the cell and minimizes interferences. But our results show the limitation of the well-known and widely used power-based user association. This is, for example, the last box plot. And even when associated with best response spectrum allocation, which has all the intelligence in allocating spectrum, using a user association with, based on the power degrades the the uh, performance. In fact, in this context, almost 80% of the users, this is the last bar on the right, are associated with macro BSs simply because these macro base stations have a high transmit power. And almost no users benefit from the uh, millimeter wave. So such decision uh, causes congestion and degrades the performance of the system. And the limitation of power-based user association is even more exacerbated when we are associated with a co-channel spectrum allocation. So this is a typical heuristic scenario. We have a co-channel between different tiers and we associate users based on power, uh, received power, and this has the worst performance in our simulations. Uh, the, uh, interestingly, when we use co-channel spectrum allocation, with peak rate based user association, we enhance the performances because such algorithm benefits from the presence of millimeter waves. You have around 25% of the users that benefit from the available spectrum in millimeter waves. Finally, we note that small cell first approaches, which introduce some bias to small cells, cause the congestion on fan to cells and also produce relatively poor results. Here we assess the impact of increasing or decreasing the millimeter, the millimeter wave base station density. We consider two scenarios where 5% and 25% of the generated small cells 
are dedicated to millimeter LBSs, while the remaining positions are for femtobiases. Except the last plots in here, which correspond to co-channel spectrum allocation, power-based user association, that is insensible to the spectrum of fertility, does not change when we add a millimeter wave base station. The other algorithms have their performance increased when we have additional millimeter wave base stations. Precisely with co-channel spectrum allocation and peak rate user association, these are the central plots, millimeter wave VSs absorb almost half of the users presented here in yellow uh, that are associated to the millimeter waves. But our fully distributed algorithms are more balanced. In fact, they protect the femto cells from harmful interferences, and they manage to be still attractive for the users, where we have around 20% of the femto cells that are uh, the best connection for users in this system. Our coordinated framework Prevent, prevents overdimensioning radio resources or defectively associating users to crowded sets. So with the best response algorithm we have devised for spectrum allocation enables to mitigate the impact of harmful interference, specifically on fem 2 bs And when coupled with our load-based uh, estimation, it gives the best performance. The distributed algorithm we have devised concerning, for example, the user association matched in terms of performance, the centralized one. And the fully distributed best response spectrum allocation, best response user association appears as an excellent candidate if we want a fully distributed solution to resource management in a heterogeneous network. Second, we noted that capturing the different characteristics of the radio propagation channel in terms of uh, transmit power, bandwidth, is very important in selecting and managing resources in heterogeneous networks. And this mainly explains the shortcomings of all the power-based user association and the peak rate-based association. These two approaches, they lack and they do not consider all the characteristics of the radio propagation. Finally, a well-known method which introduced some bias towards small cells did not enable to benefit from the millimeter wave spectrum. On the contrary, it provoked some congestion on the overloaded fan 2 bs and degraded the performance. Our work on heterogeneous networks and dense deployment started back in 2011. We have explored a large variety of aspects related to rat selection in HetNet, in CloudRAN, and in network slicing. And these are published in major journals. Uh, we have also published the code for the coordinated framework with a demo set data set. The third research challenge I am presenting today deals with massive connectivity. In our research works, we answered the crucial question on how to deploy scalable LoRaWAN networks with multiple gateways and how to enable the coexistence of multiple IoT operators in the same bandwidth. Our attention has been drawn to LoRaWAN as a promising low power wide area network solution. LoRaWAN uses a more, uh, robust modulation called LoRa based on a variation of chirp sped spectrum. We have spreading factors going from seven to 12 that enable to increase the coverage at the expense of lower data rates. And these uh, uh, rates, typically range from 300 bit per second to 5.5 kilobits per second. LoRaWAN operates in license-free bands. This is typically the 868 megahertz in Europe. And as such, it should comply with the ETSI regulations. So the maximum allowed transmit power should be less or equal to 14 dBm, and the transmissions are restricted by a 1% duty cycle. LoRaWAN uses a very simple approach for channel access. It's an Aloha-based algorithm, and devices can transmit uh, randomly on a randomly chosen channel without any coordination. So unfortunately, packets that are transmitted simultaneously on the same spreading factor and channel will collide and the transmission will be lost. We started by investigating the radio channel in the 868 megahertz in order to devise a pathless model 
for LoRaWAN communications. We needed a pass-loss model that is adapted for long-range communication in the 868 megahertz band with low antenna heights, as typically with IoT devices, and also for irregular terrain profile and topography variation, such as typically the hilly Mediterranean and mountain topography in Lebanon. Therefore, we carried out an extensive measurement campaign in both indoor, outdoor, urban, and rural environment. And as a result, we designed an empirical pathos model for LoRaWAN for these different environments. So we see here an example of the pathos empirical model for an urban outdoor scenario. And we note on the figure that if we compare our pathos model, empirical pathos model, to typical state-of-the-art approaches, for example, Okumura Hata and COS 231, these two models, they uh, predict higher pass loss, they are represented in green, with a mean error of 2 <coughs> and 3.9 dB, respectively, whereas our proposed model reduces the error and fits the sample with more accuracy. But despite its soaring popularity, LoRaWAN has multiple challenges still to solve, mainly pertaining to its scalability problems. As in any wireless access technology, we refer to densification in order to improve the coverage. So let us consider a geographical area of 100 square kilometer with a deployment of one, two, or four gateways and 3,000 nodes that are uniformly distributed in this geographical area. Looking at the percentage of out of coverage nodes, which is represented on the right part of the figure, we note that 25% of the node are out of coverage when you have one gateway. When we densify the deployment, adding a second and four gateways, this percentage is decreasing and reaches zero. So densification basically reaches its primary expected target. What is unexpected is a distribution of nodes on spreading factor. Look well at when having four gateways, almost 80% of the nodes will use spreading factor seven to connect to the nearest gateway because they have good radio condition. So using a simple adaptive data rate algorithm, they would choose the lowest spreading factor to reduce energy consumption. And this enables them to reach the nearest gateway. And such unbalance in the distribution of nodes on spreading factors severely impacts the performance of LoRaWAN. For instance, if you look at an area site of six kilometers uh, in the right figure, we see that for one gateway, we have a packet delivery ratio of around 57%. And we, when we add um, uh, uh, four gateways, we have 47%. So we have a decrease in packet delivery ratio, although we are densifying the network. So briefly, gateway densification solved the coverage problem as expected, but this comes at the cost of a severe reduction of the packet delivery ratio. Therefore, it becomes crucial and very important to find the solution that enables to fully benefit from the densification and adding more gateways in a lower one network. For this, we devised an optimization problem that assigns spreading factors to nodes in a way to maximize the total throughput in the network. The SF selection is constrained by the radio conditions on the node. The throughput utility uses a simple Aloha model for LoRaWAN with a fixed packet size and Poisson traffic load, GS, on spreading factor SFS. The problem is convex and can be easily solved in practice. But in order to easily implement it and staying compliant with class A devices in LoRaWAN, we introduced an adaptive algorithm that simply tunes the spreading factor thresholds in order to steer the SF selection to the optimal computed value. So whenever this algorithm computed centrally on the network server produces a percentage of nodes on each spreading factor, it will compute the new thresholds, announce them to the uh, LoRa one node, and each node will reconfigure its spreading factor in order to deploy the optimal solution transparently. The simulations are very conclusive, and our optimal spreading factor selection takes full advantage of the densification. Look at the plot in green. 
Now we have the best overall performance when we have four gateways. And for a dense deployment with an area side of six kilometer, our algorithm enhanced the normalized throughput from 0 0.2 to around one. So what happens when multiple co-located operators share the same unlicensed bandwidth? Well, collisions will become even more harmful and operators will not be able to commit to any server level agreement, service level agreement. And in order to solve this issue, some type of cooperation is needed between these competing operators. So we investigated a partial cooperation scenario where operators share the traffic load information on each spreading factor and the minimum cooperation scenarios where each operator will predict the success rate on each spreading factor using recurrent neural network with long short term memory, and then optimize the SF selection using an optimization formulation as we have seen before. The last proposal is particularly attractive, especially when we look at the increase in the throughput compared to the legacy LoRa one where no cooperation is put in place. Our works on massive connectivity is a collective effort with three PhDs and two postdocs. Particularly with my colleague at USG, Dr. Hello, we have been invited as tutorial speakers in major events such as IEEE 5G World Forum and conferences such as WPMC and ICT. We have also deployed a large scale test bed in Lebanon that enabled to perform the large scale measurement and devise the pass loss model for LoRaWAN. So many promising perspectives stem from my research works. I will highlight in the following some of these perspectives pertaining to each of the challenges I presented today. Full duplex has finally been listed as one of the subjects of interest for 5G advanced. So 3GPP release 18 is currently starting to study the feasibility of allowing the coexistence of downlink and uplink in the same time with a conventional TDD band. So this lays some, the foundation and some hope for the future of full duplex. And the research track we started some years ago opens a very promising perspective, typically with using full duplex in conjunction with massive MIMO. In fact, the channel state information acquired at full duplex nodes will be infer imperfect due to estimation errors. In such case, self-interference cancellation becomes a big hurdle with a large number of antennas that are available in massive MIMO. So in any case, a full duplex massive MIMO system should deal with a significant residual self-interference. We can use typically supervised and reinforcement learning techniques for traffic prediction in order to enable scheduling of uplink and downlink users. And with such approaches, we can avoid the large overhead of pilot assisted massive MIMO channel estimations. When exploring highly dense deployments, one promising solution is to use a distributed massive MIMO architecture known as cell-free massive MIMO. Each user in the cell-free massive MIMO system is coherently served by a large number of geographically distributed access points through special multiplexing on the same time frequency resource. As a result, the UE is agnostic of the cell boundary, hence the name cell-free. So we will explore on our level the dynamic clustering that enables to reduce the dimension of the problem and the amount of data exchange. In fact, users will adjust the number of serving access points based on their traffic needs and under channel conditions. Hedonic games, merge and split, and uh, cooperative game theory are tools we have already used and will be insightful here to build solutions for these complex clustering problems. To broaden and enhance 5G support for IoT, 3GPP has recently defined a new class of devices coined REDCap, reduced capacity. In fact, reduced capacity will, some kind, will be some kind of a trade-off, a compromise between the performance of NB-IoT with low bandwidth and 5G URLC or EMBB providing very high data rates. The target application in here is typically industrial IoT. So red cap devices 
will uh, certainly have low cost of manufacturing. So we'll have a simplified design with narrower bandwidth, fewer antennas and receive chains. In such context, we will explore the optimization of energy and spectral efficiency of red cap devices. We will also focus on device to device communications that are newly uh, presented in 5G advanced over the 5G side link. So we'll answer questions on how to enable sensing, selection, and power control in order to mitigate the harmful interferences. Finally, we are interested by exploring the extension of REDCAP with this capacity, capacity of uh, deploying uh, low-cost devices uh, to the integrated sensing and communication paradigm, the ISAC paradigm. If REDCAP devices can perform sensing tasks and basic machine learning, then how can they cooperate in order to optimize such tasks? Coalition formation, or what we call also edge computing, are typical perspectives we have started to explore in our latest works. <laughs>